from ABC, this is World News Tonight, with Peter Jennings in London with the foreign news and the latest on Iran. Max Robinson in Chicago, part two of a special assignment series, Defense, Reagan's Billion Dollar Choices. And from our desk in Washington, Frank Reynolds. Good evening. Real progress today in Iran, and only a relatively mild reminder from Washington that things could still go wrong. So, on this 438th day of the hostage crisis, the United States and Iran have moved to the very edge of an agreement. At our foreign desk in London, here is Peter Jennings. Peter? Frank, in Tehran itself today, there are further indications that Iran is moving, perhaps rapidly, towards a resolution of the hostage issue. The tone of statements from Iranian officials is generally positive and the Iranian parliament did meet to expedite at least one piece of legislation which the government has said will make the process easier. With the details of the parliamentary session here in London is ABC's Bob Dyke. There was a final attempt by an outer fringe Islamic radical to block this morning's parliamentary vote. Hassan Ayat, the militant member of the Islamic Republican Party's governing council, demanded to know why Iran was degrading itself by dealing with the U.S. on financial terms. I know you want to release the hostages, Ayat said to the head of Iran's negotiating team, Basad Nabavi, but do we really want to be reduced to this? House Speaker Rafsanjani then closed the debate and called for a vote. The bill approved by Parliament gives Prime Minister Rajayi's government powers to deal with the U.S. through a third party which will arbitrate differences instead of merely acting as a messenger service. Since it seems the Algerians are already actively involved in negotiations, it appears Parliament has approved of existing efforts to resolve the crisis. Nabavi told Parliament, we have rubbed the nose of the U.S. in the dirt. Now it is time, he said, to get rid of the issue, either by freeing or trying the hostages within the next few days. Bob Dyke, ABC News, London. Well, outside Parliament today, another of Iran's senior negotiators told us there was a possibility the hostages could be on their way home this weekend. Ahmed Azizi, in a phone conversation with ABC's Chris Harper, added, however, there was still one outstanding question. It involves Iran's deposits in American banks and how much would be transferred to Algeria immediately to hopefully trigger the hostages' departure. Azizi told Harper Iran had not specified the amount that it will probably do so tomorrow. Azizi would not discuss an amount, but he did say that via the Algerians, the U.S. and Iran are close to agreement. In Algiers itself, as Doreen Kayes reports, the American negotiating team kept plugging. Warren Christopher and his team have now been at it seven days and nights, still coming and going between the U.S. Embassy and the Algerian Foreign Ministry, still giving and receiving messages. Christopher is quoted through the State Department as saying he hopes today's Iranian parliament decision is a helpful move in the right direction towards resolving the remaining issues. Negotiator Harold Saunders, asked by ABC News about reports of hostage money already deposited in Algerian banks, said not true. According to one source here tonight, the negotiators are very tired, but they will continue to work, wait, and keep silent. Doreen Kayes, ABC News, Algiers. This is Barry Dunsmore in Washington. Top U.S. officials believe that the action by Iran's parliament today removes a major obstacle to the resolution of the crisis. These officials had feared that hardliners might refuse to allow changes in the original conditions parliament had set for the hostages' release. That problem did not materialize, so we are now an important step closer to a deal. But as Secretary Muskie cautioned today, we aren't there yet. The final substantive questions need, uh, need to be decided. That legislation may have cleared the way uh, for the uh, Iranian negotiators to make that final decision, but they have not done so at this point. The reason top State Department officials are so cautious is that for all the back-and-forth contact there has been, the U.S. has no Iranian document which indicates Iran's acceptance of anything. Certain assumptions can be made. Iran has asked a whole series of questions based on an American proposal and on American dollar figures, and ultimately seems to be satisfied with the answers. So it may be assumed that an agreement is very near. But until there is an actual Iranian proposal on the table, which contains no surprises, there can be no deal. Officials here hope they will have such a document in hand by tomorrow. Barry Dunsmore, ABC News, the State Department.
Still ahead, Ronald Reagan says goodbye to California and heads east to prepare for his inauguration. Chrysler hoping for good news in its latest round of survival meetings and bad news for Florida's orange growers caught in the big freeze. <laughs> Chrysler Corporation and the Auto Workers Union have bargained back and forth and struggled to keep the company going and the workers working. Late this afternoon, they said they had succeeded. We have a report from Ron Miller. The Federal Loan Board had already begun its meeting on Chrysler's application for $400 million in additional loan guarantees when a UAW spokesman uh, announced that for the third time in 14 months, union negotiators had sacrificed uh, pay and benefits to help Chrysler survive. Uh, they understand Chrysler's desperate financial, you know, circumstances, and, you know, we'll be submitting it, uh, if it's acceptable this afternoon, you know, to the rank and file. The union will release no details of what it agreed to give away to the company until the loan board decides if the union's concessions are enough. The board said yesterday that union sacrifices at that point were inadequate. It is believed the union is still refusing to give up all of the $673 million in wages and benefits demanded by the company over the next 20 months. This much is known. The most difficult issue in the negotiations has been the union's cost of living allowance, or COLA. For Chrysler workers, the benefit, which is tied to the quarterly inflation rate, currently means an additional $1.15 an hour. Chrysler wants to eliminate COLA which the union insists represents a cut in pay on top of the wage freeze the UAW has already agreed to. And the union's leadership isn't sure how many sacrifices workers will make. Uh, I told Secretary Miller a serious question in my mind whether or not we could uh, sell the design of the program that was given to us uh, to the membership of our union. But for now, the key issue is selling the loan board on Chrysler's fragile survival plan. Ron Miller, ABC News, Washington. Chrysler's survival ultimately depends, of course, on whether it sells cars. And in the first 10 days of January, it did. Sales were up 5%, the only increase for the big three. GM was down 17%, Ford down 33%. And in Detroit today, governors from seven Midwestern states, most affected by the automakers' problems, call for lower interest rates and tax breaks to help the ailing industry. They said Ronald Reagan would meet with them soon. The nation's economic problems are not being helped by this week's deep freeze all along the East Coast. Millions of dollars worth of fruit and vegetables have been damaged. In Daytona Beach, Florida, at 19 degrees, it was colder last night than in New York City. And those kinds of temperatures have devastated this year's citrus crop. Bob Serkin reports. 3 a.m., another all-night vigil in the Coward family's orange grove. What's the rate? 24. 24. We haven't raised a bit. The thermometer has dropped another degree. For a second straight night, a killer frost is eating through 70 acres or 41,000 boxes of prime temple oranges. As the juice expands, it breaks the cell, and you can see that the cells are broken within the fruit itself at this point, which means that we have ice in the fruit. Not since December of 1962 has it been this cold in these orange groves. Back then, the cold not only destroyed Florida's orange crop, but ruined the trees as well. And that might happen again. Like hundreds of other growers around here, the cowards have fired up kerosene heaters trying to salvage the trees. Others are watered down and frozen at a more tolerable 32 degrees. But the cowards' crop is declared a total loss. 
Central Florida produces 74% of the nation's citrus. 90% of all orange juice comes from here. The cold wave has now killed 20% of the total orange crop, a loss of 36 million boxes of oranges, 49 million gallons of concentrated juice. But industry experts say the consumer will be spared to some degree. The best thing consumers got, of course, is the fact we've just had two price decreases uh, just recently. So uh, we have been furnishing orange juice at a real good buy in the supermarket. And uh, if we do have a price increase, uh, it shouldn't be significant enough to cause a whole lot of difference in what she's been used to. This weekend's forecast here calls for another blast of Arctic air. That says one orange grower could put the nail in our coffin. Bob Serkin, ABC News, Lakeland, Florida. One immediate result of that freeze, the nation's top three orange juice processes have just raised wholesale prices about a nickel for a six ounce can. Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee today recommended that James G. Watt be confirmed as Secretary of the Interior and that Ronald Reagan's nominee to be Secretary of Energy, James Edwards, also be confirmed. Democrats on the committee expressed some reservations about both men, but there were no votes against either. And General Alexander Haig ended five days of hearings, 32 full hours, before the Foreign Relations Committee today. A vote to recommend his confirmation to be Secretary of State is expected tomorrow. For Haig and the committee, yesterday's storm was followed by today's calm. We have a report from Britt Hume. Haig was in the home stretch today, the tense crossfire over Watergate behind him, replaced by a ceasefire which lasted all day. There was, for example, this from one of his main antagonists. General, it's been an interesting five days. We've tried to do our job, and you've tried to do yours, and I thank you. Thank you, Senator. The committee has gotten from Haig some sense of his concerns and intentions. On military force, there are things worth fighting for, he says, and things worse than war. On the Soviet military buildup, this seems his main concern. He wants both U.S. and NATO forces beefed up. On arms limitation, no salt talks with the Soviets until U.S. military posture improves. On Cuba, no normalization while Cuba makes trouble around the world. On human rights, it will not get the priority it has. We all share the same objectives. A strong America, working with honor and grace to fulfill its global responsibility. Finally, Haig promised he, not the president's national security advisor, would manage this administration's foreign policy. After his performance here these past five days, no senator doubted that. Britt Hume, ABC News, on Capitol Hill. There is also no doubt the Reagan administration is committed to strengthening the country's military power. Tonight, in the second of his special assignment reports, Pentagon correspondent John McQuethy examines one expensive and controversial plan already set in motion by the Carter administration. The new rapid deployment force is another multi-billion dollar option that Ronald Reagan must deal with immediately. 
the guts of the force, the Army's crack airborne divisions loading for missions halfway around the world, the Marines hitting the beaches. As created by President Carter, this force is made up of units from all parts of the military, coordinated by a new joint command. On short notice, it's supposed to be able to move 50,000 troops or more to a trouble spot anywhere in the world. But the rapid deployment force is bogged down in controversy. There are crippling shortages of planes and ships needed to move troops, inadequate desert fighting capabilities, equipment so heavy it can't be moved by air. It is a standing invitation to military disaster. If you, if you liked the uh, Iranian rescue mission of uh, last April, uh, you will love the, the Rapid Deployment Force. The Rapid Deployment Force has been called a paper tiger by some of its critics. Is it a viable thing today? It is a reality. What's needed is to make it stronger. Our Rapid Deployment Forces exist. For the new Reagan administration, which is trying to cut overall federal spending, the new Rapid Deployment Force is another very expensive choice that's filled with headaches. The Army and Marine Corps are feuding over which service should control the new force, and the Air Force and Navy are asking for at least $10 billion to buy new ships and planes to get the troops to the battlefield. Assuming the men could somehow get to a trouble spot in the Middle East just to survive in the desert, a soldier needs to drink 12 gallons of water a day. The military doesn't have the mobile storage tanks to handle that kind of demand. It's also been discovered that equipment of all kinds, from guns to helicopters, don't work so well in the sand and dust. Another problem, the Army's powerful new XM-1 tank. It's monstrously heavy, 60 tons, so heavy in fact it can only be flown to the battlefield one at a time. If the rapid deployment force is going to work, the military needs a lighter, smaller tank. This test vehicle is a quarter of the weight and less than half the cost of the Army's main battle tank, the XM-1. But how many of these lighter tanks could the Army and Marine Corps put in the field today? Not one. Under the new Reagan administration, both the Army and Marine Corps hope to have enough money to seriously consider a light tank. While they look, the Army will already be using the 9th Infantry Division at Fort Lewis, Washington as its guinea pig. What we're really trying to do is to come up with that optimum mix of combat power and lightness that'll allow this division to respond rapidly to a contingency anywhere in the world. Bypassing the time-consuming research and development process, the division uses a radio scanner from a discount store to help jam enemy radio transmissions. It's less expensive and far less bulky than the Army's version. They also mounted miniguns taken from a helicopter onto the back of jeeps to get a lightweight but deadly air defense. Certainly, we would get there as quick as we could with whatever we could uh, muster, but the new concept is uh, at least uh, months away and probably more likely years away from being the kind of uh, capability we need. During the campaign, Ronald Reagan pledged to dramatically boost America's military strength and at the same time to cut federal spending. He'll soon discover that to build up America's nuclear arsenal and to make the rapid deployment force a reality will cost hundreds of billions of dollars. That's a price that even a pro-military Congress may not be willing to pay. John McWethy, ABC News, the Pentagon.
time since the busing, school busing controversy erupted in Buckeye, Louisiana, the federal judge and the state judge defying him met face to face today in open court. And there were harsh words. Rebecca Chase reports. Together they have been defying a federal desegregation order and together State Judge Richard Lee and the three Buckeye girls went to federal court today. This controversy began when Judge Lee ordered the three girls put in the custody of friends so they could attend all-white Buckeye school. A federal judge had previously ordered the three bus to a racially mixed school. In court today, federal judge Nauman Scott said, I would like to think this is a monumental case. It is not. The same arguments were used in Little Rock and the University of Mississippi. There's been a million cases just like it. The federal judge then ordered the state judge to stop interfering with the desegregation order. Lawyers for Judge Lee contend this case is different because it involves the state's right to decide custody matters. It is not something that has been adjudicated before. If it were, you can rest assured Judge Scott would have had the case right in point that would have said, and if he had, I wouldn't be here. Judge Lee and the girls will be back in court tomorrow to explain why they should not be held in contempt of court. Rebecca Chase, ABC News, Alexandria, Louisiana. Here in Washington, the Food and Drug Administration today approved for general use contact lenses that can be worn continuously for as long as two weeks. Bettina Gregory has this report. Extended wear contact lenses are made of the same material as soft contact lenses. They're different only in that they allow more oxygen to pass through them and thus they can be worn for longer periods of time. Until now, extended wear lenses have been available only to some patients who've undergone cataract surgery. But the Food and Drug Administration says it's now safe to prescribe them for people with ordinary vision problems for continuous wear up to two weeks. These new lenses may start a revolution in the contact lens industry. But before rushing out to buy them, the consumer should note they have drawbacks. The drawbacks seem to be that the lenses are going to accumulate dirt. And as the dirt accumulates on the lens, it won't be as permeable to oxygen, which the eye needs and could cause infection or other problems. The main disadvantage um, is the cost. They cost between uh, four and five hundred dollars. They will probably have to be replaced at least every two years. But the Food and Drug Administration says there's no apparent reason why anyone who can now wear soft contact lenses couldn't switch, provided they're willing to trade off the higher price for longer continuous wear. Bettina Gregory, ABC News, Washington. In other news overseas today, two American Air Force planes have crashed in Western Europe. Eleven people in total have been killed. A Phantom fighter with its two crewmen went down near Molina in Spain. A Hercules transport with nine on board crashed just after takeoff in West Germany. In Italy today, a purported message from Red Brigade terrorists said the judge they've kidnapped, Giovanni Durso, will be set free. The message did not say when or where. And finally, from overseas, a report on the war between Iran and Iraq. There are now signs that Iran's much heralded counteroffensive against Iraq in the province of Khuzestan has run into trouble. Near the town of Susangerd, for example, Iraqis are claiming they have won the biggest battle since the Gulf War began. As ABC's Hal Walker reports, Iraqi soldiers call it the killing ground. The Battle of Carthagia lasted just three days, say the Iraqis, despite claims from Iran of a successful offensive. The Iraqi commander proudly went over the details of the encounter. Three Iranian armored brigades attacked from Susan Garrett on the north. One brigade on the east flank was routed the first day, he said. The other two were lured south and caught between Iraqi forces after they crossed the Kharki River. The counteroffensive, he said, was crushed. The Iraqis claim they destroyed or captured some 150 Iranian tanks in this battle alone. Not all of the losses were Iranian. At least two Iraqi helicopters were shot down in the fighting, and reporters counted more than 40 Iraqi tanks among the charred remains. The big battle of Carthagia is over, but the war between these traditional enemies goes on. It is unlikely the Iranians will attempt another major offensive before spring, but the Iraqis say they are braced for the counterattack they know will come inevitably. Hal Walker, ABC News, near Susengard, Iran.
One of those constructive forces is the enhancement of individual human freedoms through the strengthening of democracy and the fight against deprivation, torture, terrorism, and the persecution of people throughout the world. The struggle for human rights overrides all differences of color or nation or language. Those who hunger for freedom, who thirst for human dignity, and who suffer for the sake of justice, they are the patriots of this cause. I believe with all my heart that America must always stand for these basic human rights at home and abroad. That is both our history and our destiny. America did not invent human rights. In a very real sense, it's the other way around. Human rights invented Finally America. Finally tonight, President-elect Reagan landed in Washington just a short while ago and said he is looking forward to his inauguration and to wrestling with the problems that have to be faced. On Tuesday, the White House becomes his official residence, but it was not easy to leave his home in California today. Susan King has this report. Daughter Patty said leaving was more emotional than her parents expected. For the Reagans, moving to the White House also means leaving the Pacific Palisades home they've lived in for almost 30 years. They're selling it, and almost as a gesture to that final leaving, the Reagans walk down their winding driveway to say personal goodbyes to the neighbors. This is awfully hard to leave. I think we moved there when I was four years old, so it's um, emotional. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Flags boarded the one-mile drive through the Pacific Palisades. Here, residents waved. At a local high school with cheering students organized by the Reagan staff, Reagan made his only formal goodbye. We hope you'll have no reason to regret this great kindness that you've shown us. We'll do our best. For Reagan, emotion became words. For Nancy, it was tears. With the plane bearing the presidential seal, a band, and a crowd awaiting at the airport, Reagan's mood changed. But here, no words, just the wave. The last he would make to California as the president-elect. Susan King, ABC News, Los Angeles. Thank you, Susan. President Carter delivers his farewell address to the country tonight. His speech will be broadcast by ABC News at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. On Nightline tonight, a look back at the Carter years and an interview with the president's advisor, Hamilton Jordan. Once again, tonight's top story, the United States and Iran seem to be on the edge of an agreement to end the hostage crisis. That's our report for now on World News Tonight. For ABC News, good night.